Today on CityCast Philly, there's an ongoing debate happening on college campuses. Some institutions have released statements around the ongoing Israel-Hamas war, while some students, faculty, alumni, and donors say they appreciate the efforts. Others are angry and say they feel left out. I'm speaking with a reporter about how higher education leadership grapples with communication around controversial topics. It's Monday, October 30th. I'm Trinane Uri, and here's what Philly's talking about. Karen Fisher, senior writer at the Chronicle of Higher Education. You recently wrote about how universities are speaking up about events in Israel and Gaza. Here in Philly at the University of Pennsylvania and also in New Jersey at Rutgers University, leadership made statements about the conflict. Karen, can you give us a quick timeline of these recent instances? Sure. I think in both uh, at both Rutgers and Penn, they at least had sort of similar timelines. Um, obviously, the attacks by Hamas on Israeli citizens happened on October 7th. Within a couple of days, the leadership of both institutions released statements, and they were generally um, statements of condolence. They expressed outrage at the attacks. And very quickly, there were responses, backlashes even, to both statements. Let me take Rutgers first. It was more straightforward. In Rutgers' case, there was um, pushback from both students and faculty who were upset that uh, President Jonathan Holloway's statement did not make reference to Palestinians, um, civilians who had lost their lives or who'd been dislocated, especially as Israel began retaliatory um, strikes. And they said that was um, a little tone deaf, given that there is a substantial about 7,000 um, either Muslim or Arab students who go to the different Rutgers campuses. At Penn, it was a bit more complicated because the pushback came from multiple sides. You had um, both objections um, from students and faculty who said that um, both the initial statement that President Liz McGill made and then a subsequent statement did not even mention Palestine and really focused more on the um, suffering of uh, Israeli civilians. And the condolences were more focused on um, Jewish students. At the same time, you also had um, a number of donors in particular, but also students and faculty who criticized the statements for not taking um, a hard enough stance, not condemning um, terrorism. And so actually, President McGill had to put out a third statement to try to meet the demands of, of all those sides. Why does leadership at colleges or universities even feel like it's their place to say anything at all, especially during war? I mean, that's an excellent question. And certainly there's a history of college presidents of campus leaders speaking out on issues. Um, it dates back decades. But I, when I spoke with um, people who look at these kind of presidential communications, they do say that they seem to have had an uptick in recent years. Um, during the Trump administration, for example, um, president speaking out about things like the travel ban. And then more recently, um, obviously, the killing of George Floyd, the Black Lives Matter protests, even things like abortion have all been occasions where you've had a substantial number of, of institutional leaders, of university leaders speaking out. And I think they would say that there are several reasons that they do this. I think they would say that they are trying to provide condolence, reassurance, support um, to students, faculty, other members of the institutional college community who might be affected by particular events or policy choices. Um, and I think there are other um, institutional leaders or the university leaders who say that higher ed has kind of a, this other role, that it can be sort of a, a moral voice and so that it carries weight both on its campus in broader sort of constituencies and they might see, um, you know, a need to speak out for those reasons. And then finally, I think there's just been this growing expectation because you have this history of speaking out that, OK, if you spoke out on abortion, if you spoke out on Black Lives Matter, if you spoke out on Ukraine and Russia's invasion, then, of course, you know, you've got to speak out on something like the Israel Hamas war. 
Karen, is the war something different this time? How does a university kind of pick and choose when to speak up and when not to speak up? Because there's issues happening around campuses, on campuses, that sometimes there's nothing said about those particular issues. So why these issues? I mean, you put your finger on on the real dilemma, really. Uh, When is appropriate to speak up? Um, To to your first question, I think that the Israel-Palestine situation both is and is not of a piece with these other issues. It would be an understatement to say that Israel and Palestine is is not a new issue. I mean, certainly the the war that the violence that's happening there is, um, but this has historically been an incredibly divisive issue in the country and especially on college campuses. I talked to um, an expert with Pan America, which is a free speech group that she goes around and she visits a lot of campuses and talks with campus constituencies about what are the kind of the the really difficult discussions and debates to have on campus. And she said, inevitably, one of the things that people answer is Israel-Palestine. And so there's just this history of it being this particularly divisive issue. And it divides folks on campus who, you know, honestly, probably agree on 95% of other stuff, but they just don't disagree. They just don't agree, rather, on this. And you also have just the general climate for speech on campus and these pressures around it. And and so in some ways, um, it's a trite phrase, but... um, this is a particular sort of perfect storm of just all these factors kind of colliding and institutions kind of try to to figure out how to best respond. Do colleges and universities get pressure from other stakeholders to make these statements? Yes, they can get pressure from different stakeholders, both to make statements and to not make statements, in fact. Obviously, let's look at a couple of obvious stakeholders. You have students and faculty, other campus employees who um, there there are those internal sort of immediate on campus groups that are looking for leadership to speak out. Then you sort of like expand that circle outward and you have groups like alumni and donors. And particularly in Penn's case, these were very, very vocal groups. You know, you had donors who really felt particularly that Penn's leadership did not strongly condemn anti-Semitism enough in some of its early statements and and has, in fact, threatened to withhold contributions to the universities. And some of these are very large ticket donors. And then if you sort of um, expand the circle outward, this has not been such a big issue this time, but it's been somewhat of, of one historically, which is at public institutions, at public colleges, you've got this, this other group of state lawmakers who may feel either that colleges are supposed to say something or in some cases they may feel like, no, you're, you're sort of getting over your skis, so to speak. Right. Karen, you also reported that there is actually a movement against university officials speaking about controversial topics. What's that argument and who's making it? Sure. I mean, there are um, institutional university leaders themselves, but also some free speech groups that say, you know, basically, if, if university leaders stake out positions or take public stances on issues, they're kind of putting a finger on the scale. And that if university campuses are supposed to be places where we have these open debates and discussions, if you've got a college president sort of saying, this is the institutional sort of statement on these things, is that chilling speech? And um, free speech groups will point to some places, for example, The University of Arizona is one of them where the, you know, you had Palestinian, pro-Palestinian students um, say that they were going to to not hold a a rally because the leadership put out a statement, um, both expressing concern about the planned rally, but also that the statement had been in support of, of Israel. And so they didn't feel comfortable doing that. And so the, the, the concern, I think, for these people um, is if university leaders take these stances, does that open up enough space? And so they would say, unless it's something that directly affects the institution itself, its operations, its students, its faculty, that, that you shouldn't speak out. But then the question becomes, what qualifies? You know, some people would say, for to take a, an example that's not about Israel and Palestine, a, abortion. Some people would say, look, that's a big, thorny debate that's happening across the country. It's not a, a higher ed discussion. 
And so this should be something where, you know, we're not, where university leaders take sort of a more of a hands-off position. And other people would say, look, often 60% of your students are female. Isn't this by definition the, the place that, that college leaders should say something? And so it, it's a push and you you actually saw a number of colleges sort of issue statements in, result, in response to the Israel-Hamas war that, that essentially took these kind of neutral stances. But it's also a complicated debate as well. Karen, is all of this really about public relations or just are, are, are these statements deeper? Do they translate into actual real action at universities? Well, that really remains to be seen. Cynically, people would say that the reason that university leaders do speak out is to is to try to, to manage the image of the institution, to try to respond to the demands of, of certain constituencies um, on campus or in these sort of off-campus that, that might um, expect statements to be made. But I think the real test is going to be what happens next, what goes beyond statements. Can there be constructive dialogue around, around these issues? And I mean, the notion of, you know, a lot of people would say the reason that that campus leaders rather speak up is that then that kind of starts a broader campus conversation and that it can be, that statements are just that. They're just sort of the initial words and what are the actions that you take afterwards. And so I think there's going to be a lot of um, of attention paid and, and, and expectations of institutions to continue the, the dialogue and hopefully in productive ways. I think there are challenges, though, to, to doing that. And so it can be very difficult to come into to dialogue or to have, um, you know, to have te- so-called te- teachable moments, right? Like a starting point. Yeah. Yes. And so uh, right now, I think a lot, frankly, of, of the efforts that have been happening on a lot of campuses have been very student driven. Um, you know, they've been vigils and teach-ins and things like that. And so um, I think one of the the real things that I'll be watching is do these lead into more productive conversations that, that universities are, are helping to, if not shape, at least lead or provide the, you know, the, the space for it. Because people would argue, I mean, that's the one thing that you are one of the key things that universities can do, that it's a place for difference and disagreement. And, and you know, it's that place where, you know, young people come together and, and, and cannot kind of air those differences and learn for them, from them. And so if, if we just end with statements, how, you know, did, did higher education tackle that issue, really? Karen Fisher, senior writer at The Chronicle of Higher Education. Thank you so much for breaking this all down with me and for joining me on CityCast Philly. Thanks for an interesting conversation. We'll have a link to Karen's full story in our show notes. That's all for today here on CityCast Philly. We'd love for you to rate the show, leave us a review, and hit that subscribe button. Be sure to sign up for our morning newsletter, Hey Philly, to learn more about what else Philly's talking about. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye. Bye.